Okay, this is a uh, big history, uh, 2021, uh, session two. Uh, today we are looking at um, cave painting. Um, the oldest painting is about 44,000 years old. Uh, one of them is found in the uh, Spain region in uh, Western Europe. But lately, it seems that um, the cave painting in Indonesia seems to be much older. It's dated at 45,500 years ago. So there's, there's a little bit of older painting in uh, Indonesia. Probably uh, we still haven't found the real, really old painting yet. Because as we are exploring more and more, then we probably will, will be able to find more and more. Um, the significance of uh, painting starting at that age, I think represents a kind of a cognitive leap forward by human, because obviously um, we don't see any animals doing any art at the moment. We are the only animals which do art. So probably there's a big difference here. So, so let's look at some of the paintings. This one is from the Spain region, uh, near French and Spain, that uh, region. So these are the different areas. Uh, I'm not particularly into what this number represent. Probably this represent different, um, maybe time or maybe location, maybe type, et cetera. We don't know, but there, um, we found that there's quite a bit of uh, painting in that region. This is one of them. If you ask me, I think this is actually pretty artistic and accurate. So the amount of skills involved in painting this um, this painting will be will be quite quite demanding. There's color there. There's also fine lines and representations, etc. And this one is about thirty six thousand years ago and first discovered by. Uh, somebody in 1868. When it's discovered, uh, people argue whether this is a old painting or a modern painting and being um, looked as like ancient paintings, it is a fake. But eventually we got some technology into uh, identifying when the paint is being made by looking at the uh, color pigments doing isotopic um, analysis of the uh, color pigments, we now have an idea of how, how many years ago they are being made. Uh, in particular, they're using uh, uranium isotopes. Uh, these are called polychromatic arts. That means they have uh, more, more than one color, uh, poly, many cro chromatic color, uh, multicolor arts. Here I highlighted one, one particular sentence here. P. Hoss, historic human beings lack sufficient ability for abstract thoughts. So that was the argument. Oh, we, we, abstract thoughts is only available to human in modern times. Obviously not. It, it is at least um, 45,000 years ago. But that is also a significant mark when human advanced to the stage that they can express their idea in an abstract form. This is another cave. Hey, why wow, use the same animal? Oh, no, no, sorry. Uh, wrong direction, <laughs> moving backwards. Okay, now this is from another cave. Um, the animals are there. I think there's another interesting thing about the animals depleted in this um, uh, in these uh, arts, they are usually what we call domesticatable animals. Looks like they are more interested in representing animals that which they can domesticate. So another interesting is we don't know where are the domestication of the animals are and how that relates to the arts. So if the uh, arts represented here 
represent domesticated animals, then we may have to reconsider what is, what is the timeline of um, the agricultural revolution. Uh, this particular painting uh, dates back to about 17,000 years ago. Here are some more of these paintings. I would, I, I would just say these are very beautifully uh, drawn animals and they are overlapping each other. So we, mm -hmm. we don't know whether um, this overlap is by different uh, artists or the same artists and so forth, or maybe uh, why they, they painted like that. Is that a teaching purpose or what? We don't know what are the purpose of uh, painting these animals there. Are they uh, using use it for storytelling or something else? We don't know, but um, here are the, the beautiful paintings. Okay, the oldest one so far is from this area in Indonesia. Uh, I can't pronounce the word. Anyone help me? San Luisi. San Luisi. San Luisi, yeah. Yeah, I'm not Luisi. sure. <laughs> okay. So, uh, the, there's a, a, a timeline here, is the October 2014. Uh, before that and after that. So there's a significant uh, development uh, immediately after October 2014, and then it lasts for a couple of years. So, um, what do I see? before that, we already think okay, um, modern humans available in this area is probably um, 30,000 BC. Uh, we, we are in 2020 at the moment, so that will be. Uh, 32,000 years ago. This is based on radiocarbon dating uh, in all the rocks in the area. And so far they found no earlier evidence of human occupation. But the island almost certainly formed part of the land bridge used for the settlement of Australia and New Guinea by at least 42,000 years ago. So because we know that our people here in Australia has a, a history more than uh, 42,000 years. So they must have passed through um, Indonesia. So in Indonesia, they can't find anything earlier than 40,000 is, is a mystery, at, at least so to speak. But in October uh, 2014, they did discovered a cave painting, which dated to 40,000 years, 40, years ago. One of the hands there, hands then show there is almost 40,000 years ago. And then leading by another researcher, uh, Dr. Maxine Oberts, uh, dated that to be about 44,000 years ago. Uh, that is in December. 2019, so pretty close, pretty lately that we, we are updating the dates. The arts form in Indonesia is now dated as 44,000 years ago. So that is in line with the time when Australia has uh, is occupied by human being. In March 2020, that's last year, two small stone was, were found by a, a Griffin University archaeologist. That one dated a bit more recent, 26,000 to 40,000 uh, years ago. And then 2021, this, just this year, then the archaeologist uh, announced the discovery of uh, at least 45 and 550 years old cave art. So this is pretty new at the moment. So unfortunately, I can't find that image. Otherwise, we, that will be interesting to show you what is the latest uh, image that is being discovered. Uh, these are the so-called the earliest uh, handprint. Again, that's very interesting. Why human want to uh, 
have a painting of their hand. And again, uh, looking at this, most of this hand painting is of the right hand. So how they do that? Uh, how they spray the, the color onto the wall? Obviously, um, they put the, the, their hand on the wall and then spray color onto it to form that uh, hand print. So how, how that's done? That's quite interesting. We, we, now, at the moment, I don't have any information about what are the pigments being used. That mm. will be a very interesting um, investigation. Hopefully, it will be done by some archaeologists. To me, in the, uh, in the light of big history, we are more interested in the timing that suddenly, all this, almost in that same period, it seems human is making art. So this is the idea of abstract thoughts. How, um, if you look at any um, domesticated animals, for example, dogs or cats, do they have abstract thoughts? That means, would they be able to refer something as to something else? Um, what I mean is, for example, if we, if we give a dog a image of um, a photograph of um, of a chicken, will they imagine that being is this the means that meats that feed them? <laughs> if you feed uh, chicken meats to the dogs, that the relationship of abstract thought, or uh, for example, we have metaphors. Here. KRs give us a idea of when homo, homo species started to have the ability to, for symbols and metaphors. Because one of the idea of, of these, uh, for example, animals there, as I said, are they really um, part of a storytelling? Telling, hey, you look at something like this, then it is an um, animal which you should hunt for food and something. Is that, is that the purpose of that art, uh, art? We don't know. We have no idea because we, we, don't have, we can't ask them. But the, the appearance of all this art is about the same time, around, uh, let's say, 40,000 to 50,000 years ago. I think that represents a, a cognitive um, leap of human being. I like to quote uh, from uh, The Sapiens, one of the books I highly recommend, A uh, Big History of Mankind by a um, Israeli um, historian or archaeologist. He wrote, uh, friction has enabled us not merely to imagine things, but to do so collectively. We can weave common myths such as Biblical creation story, the Dreamtime myths of Aboriginal Australians and the nationalist myths of modern states. Such myths give sapiens the unpresented, the unpresented <laughs> ability to cooperate effectively in large numbers. Ants and bees can also work together in huge numbers, but they do, do so in a very rigid manner and only with close relatives. Wolves and chimpanzees cooperate far more flexibly than ants, but they can do so only with a small number of other individuals that they know intimately. Sapiens can cooperate in extremely flexible ways with countless numbers of strangers. So what does it mean? Um, what is holding somebody together? I think I can now, uh, stop share and then we can enter in discussion about this. Albert? Yep. What time, what era did they start using fire? Fires will be millions of years. So it's not coinciding with the eating of meat? Ah, okay. Now, the, the 
time of eating cooked cooked food, cooking, okay, will be about two million years. Mm -hmm. But the ability to control fire probably will be a couple of tens of thousands of years after they they have eat eat a cooked food. And then, so the ability to control fire is also, again, we are talking about at least one or two million years. And I, I suppose the ability to control or eating cooked food is not only homo sapiens, other homo, homo will, be able, will have eaten cooked food as well. That's, that's what, what we have seen so far. But again, the, the biggest question, of course, is why Homo sapiens uh, caused the extinction of uh, the avatars, while the avatars is actually much more adapted to the European uh, climate at that time. We know that Homo, uh, Homo, sapi Homo sapiens and the avatars existed in the European continent at the same time, but eventually we out. Um, well, out compete them. So why? That is the, the interesting question. So probably it's because of the this ability of uh, abstract thinking. Yeah, that's that would that would be a good in. Let me write that down. I will do a research on that one. When when the uh, the avatars the answer extinct would that would that time before after 44,000 years ago mm. so I'm I'm not quite sure the word are you talking about the albatross yep the 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 homo uh, never the avatars in the Anderthals, yeah Oh, Neanderthals. Sorry, yeah, because it, no, we are Sorry. looking at what 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 we are looking at is a few examples of uh, cave arts, okay, and these cave arts appear in Spain, in French, in a lot of Europe, okay, and also appears in, as far as Indonesia, so or Australia. Mm. We have uh, cave art everywhere. Of course, mm. all these cave art might have different dates. So far, the oldest is 44,000 years ago. Probably we will be able to find something even earlier. We don't know because yeah. we haven't found it yet. In Albert, in the book by Yuval Noah Harari, yep. he, he talks about 70,000 years ago when humans, or homo sapiens, started drawing animals like a uh, a lion's head on a human body and uh, we started to imagine things that don't exist in real life yeah. and he points that at the start of uh, homo sapiens gaining uh, ability to imagine relationships between other people not just family yeah. and the ability to have a shared imagination and he takes it through to saying that's how the Homo sapiens uh, predominated over the Neand Neanderthals. Yeah. Because they had the ability prior to that, um, chimpanzee and whatever, you know, you get to 180,000, sorry, 180 in a group, they need to communicate and know everyone in the group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what happened, the ability to imagine structures of strangers and relationships gave uh, Homo sapiens the ability to get together mm -hmm. and overthrow the Neanderthals. I might have had a hundred thousand, you know, a lot more people could be communicated. And yeah, he yeah. argues that a lot of our shared imagination, like a bank, it's not there real, you know, and whatever. And he takes um, Pujo. As, as an example in the book. What is Pujo? Well, it's not the factory, it's not the car and whatever. 
And if an accountant comes along and just does that, it's gone. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's the book, uh, Sapiens, yeah. Short History yeah. of yeah. Mankind. It's quite a good book. Yeah, I, I mean, Brian summarized the book very well. The, one, I think one of the key, key, key ideas given by the book is the abstract thinking. Yes. And the art, the art is only a, a incident representing that abstract thinking. So we have art set about 40, 50,000 years ago. But before that, we also have some uh, jewelries. We, we find some, for example, some shells with holes in it. So why the shells will have holes? For several, probably for several reasons. First of all, it might be at like money. It has value. Or it may be used sorry, as sorry. a jewelry. Sorry. How do I get rid of that? We, we, we see a lot of, uh, even in the tribal area, people like to carry some some um, ornaments. Uh, sorry, sorry, I can't. Sorry, I'll. Uh. Yeah, fine. We can hear you and see you. Uh, I've lost, uh, okay. Or probably he lost the connection. The also dropped down a little bit. But anyway, the, the idea here is human is. Uh, I think I, I would like to uh, expand a little bit about what Dry, uh, Brian has been talking is this uh, ability to do abstract thinking, abstract organization. A religion is a large collection of people having a shared belief believing in the same in a, in something similar and um, that share the belief makes that into a group and that group becomes very very powerful and in that group we have hierarchies we we have for example in the catholic uh, catholic church we have the pope and different bishops our bishops etc and then we have uh, different churches organized that ability to organize a very large number of people by using a shared belief yep. requires us to have an ability to think abstractly. Now, another, another interest, for example, in modern days, another thing which we all share common belief is that the notion that money is valuable. We can use money to exchange thought for some other valuable things anytime in the future. If we possess, possess that piece of paper, uh, to that lot, even a piece of paper is some numbers in the bank. You have some numbers in the bank, then you believe that you can use that numbers in exchange for something else which might be valuable to you. For example, you can buy a house, you can buy a car, or you can you can buy a piece of land, or you can buy clothes, buy food, etc. So that requires a shared belief. Everybody believing that this piece of paper, which we call money has value. Mm -hmm. So this share, share the, uh, this is abstract. You ask what is money? A lot of people can't explain to you what is actually money. They mm -hmm. just believe that that piece of paper or that number in the bank is money. Yes. But that money is very powerful for, for us to group together. And money is used in a, in a global scale. We can use money use the paper which we have to buy anything from China, from United States, from everywhere else. So this is a huge cooperation of the whole human race. You ask me, that piece of paper can be eaten, Not can, cannot be used as a notebook at the moment. Um, in the past, the, the, the money is printed on, only on one side. So during uh, hyperinflation, they can actually use that money as notepad but today you can't, you can't even <laughs> use it. No mm. So that piece of paper is totally useless, but we make value of it. We, we assign a value to it. Yes. That is an imagination, a shared belief. If suddenly we don't believe that, then that, that 
that piece of paper collapsed. Yeah. There is, there is another, another uh, varying thing I, I was talking about yesterday in my channel about um, the current uh, big debts of governments. Uh, most, most of the Europe, uh, our democ democratic governments has very large debts. Mm -hmm. And all this debt is, is only supported by the shared belief that that money is still worthwhile. One that once that uh, we believe share the belief is broken, then we will face a very, uh, very cast, cast, castral. What's that? What's the word I want to use? Catastrophe. Catastrophe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Barry. Yes, please. So, um, when when did we think that? abstract thinking first came about what what well what, about 70 more than seventy thousand years ago Seventy thousand. thank you more, more than that but yeah. obviously we don't have uh, very concrete evidence because again we are looking at different uh, different examples you know draw that conclusion yes. for example i just mentioned we saw that we have uh, shells with holes yes and then another thing is, for example, looking at the um, stone tools. The stone used to making stone tools is a very specific type of sedimental rocks. Sed sedimental rocks. Mm -hmm. And some of them doesn't exist in certain area, but we can still find stone tools in the area. So this kind of stone must have traveled very long distance. We're not, we not talking about a distance uh, somebody will be able to accomplish, say, in a month or so. You would, we are talking about distances which somebody had to walk for almost a year. The, um, the making of the stone tools is another um, piece of evidence of abstract thinking, isn't yep. it? Yes. They have to pre-plan pre and then understand how you can strike the stone at the right place to produce the, the shape you want. So there, there's a lot of very advanced thinking there. And again, looking at the stone tools, they have been available with us almost for millions of years, two or three, three billion years. Obviously, there are different stages. The initial stage is only uh, picking up a stone which um, serves the purpose. Later on, they are changing the, the shape of the stone by striking it, by polishing it. And then later on, um, the, the, the stone lies getting smaller and smaller, put it that way. There must, have been, there must have been a lot of trial and error, you know, yeah. What worked, and then when we discard it the old way, and we move on, and then we find the right sort of rock, and the shaping, and so it's it happened over a long period of time. So. Yeah. yeah. So the try and error is a very important part of almost all uh, scientific investment. But unfortunately, it seems that uh, in some countries they is going in reverse. Mm -hmm. I, I I was reading an article on the, uh, what's that, Boston Review, talking about um, how the Americans are now uh, against science. Nice. Foolish. Well, there are social issues around that. There are social reasons, but again, uh, to us, we, we look at it as foolish, but uh, there, I, I recently read another article, very interesting article is, um, they call it uh, epistemic uh, threats, ep, epi meaning uh, knowledge, uh, epistemic threat, uh, threats. Um, there are actions that we need, uh, almost a large percentage of population to cooperate in order to make it work. 
for example, uh, vaccines. Mm. But that, that gets back to our shared belief in things. And if, if that belief is broken or you don't have people coming on board, then society yeah, exactly. can break down altogether. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Uh, uh, therefore, the, the shared beliefs with uh, what is, what, what shared, how shared beliefs should be built upon. That's a really interesting question, isn't it? Yeah. We have religions. Religion is a shared belief, and you have you have worked for humans for quite as, quite some time. Although it also makes some damages, but at least a lot of uh, organization is being organized around religion, a shared belief. That's a good thing. But sometimes because of that, there are also uh, clashes between different religions, which uh, do harm as well. So. All these and other and other shared beliefs, nations. Australia as a nation. So, mm -hmm. what's that mean? Mm. Yeah, so again, uh, the moment, Mr. Peng, yes. Not so strong the belief as a nation, more like state at the moment. Going back to seven colonies. You have to tell. Explain to us what's the difference between state and nations then. <laughs> We've just withdrawn our borders. A lot. In, yeah. in uh, the Sapiens book by Harari, he suggested religions were needed when you had different tribes and you need to appeal to something above them that they would believe in so they could cooperate. Otherwise, you have the battle, my way is right, your way is right. And then you have the idea of religious coming in historically. And this is, we all have to accept this upper whatever. And it, it was a good thing for society. Yeah. Yeah. High, hierarchy. Yeah. 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 Uh, again, uh, the hierarchy thing is also a two sided show. <laughs> It can be good and can be bad. Uh, the good thing with hierarchy is um, we are more, much more organized yeah. and then we can accomplish things. For example, that's why all armies are highly heretical. Yeah. But uh, again, we are moving into a global, global village. Yes. And that hierarchy is no longer as strong as before. Things take time. The, the, I don't know, um, going to a little bit of religion, uh, no, politics, the current, yes, I just, I've been reading too many other books. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just recall the name of the book first. Uh, that book's name is called, um, what's that name? Uh, tomorrow, mm. the world, the the birth of U.S. global supremacy by Stephen uh, Wertheim. W e r t h e i m. He, he uh, this will talk about uh, the time uh, in the, especially in the uh, nine, uh, 1940, around that time uh, when United States tried to formulate um, the new world order. Yes. And uh, he, he looks at the, the deliberations of the key persons who uh, suggested the formation of uh, United Nations. So they look at the the, the intent. And in this point, he look at the intent of United States. Why why uh, United States will uh, foster the development of United Nations? Mm -hmm. The i the the idea according to the book is uh, that at that time we we are near the end of the Second World War, mm -hmm. so they are planning ahead. What, what will happen during the Second World War? That was a big argument uh, for within um, US, United States, whether they should be 
they should engage in the Second World War. There is the iso isolationist yeah. versus the Policy. global. Mm -hmm. So that that be, and um, at that time there was a Council of Foreign Affairs just got established. It doesn't yeah. use the same as I can't remember the name of the committee. Um, they were thinking what what role United States should do when the war ends. At that time, they are they don't they still do not believe that they can defeat uh, Germany. So they were imagining the world where there will be a predominantly uh, German-driven uh, world in Europe. So what is the position of United States? Would they, would they remain within United States having influence only in the North America and South America? Or do they want to expand further out? So the, the conclusion is that one quarter of the world, that means the North and South America, isn't sufficient to sustain uh, Americans' ways of, ways of lives. So they, they uh, figure they need to expand their, their scope, especially in terms of trade. So that is the main argument proposed and then how to do that. Well, they had to pull in allies. And the coldest ally, very um, uh, pre very contrasting, is that they put in United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. Thinking if, uh, with the help of United Kingdom and United States, they can do trade covering most of the world. At that time, they had neglected the Asia region. They were thinking Europe and America being a one area. And then they, they, they draw up the uh, constitution of uh, how to do that. What you want to do that they need a global army, a very powerful army. So you wanted to convince the uh, United States citizens that it, it is necessary to have a very strong army. So they propose to develop a larger a upper hierarchy, just like a religion, a God, which is called United, States, United Nations. And then mm -hmm. get mandates from the United Nations in order to, to send his army to the rest of the world. So they were thinking, okay, we, we have some very powerful um, countries to do that. So at that time, the most powerful country is actually um, Russia, United Kingdom, United States, and somehow they pull in China. So ch these four were, were now still, still the um, permanent member of the Security Council. And later on, they put in France as well. So the first, the five permanent members are, are, are this, and they retain the power of veto. That means they want to be able to control the development of United Nations, and then use United Nations as a as a higher order, so that United United States can build a very large army. At today, United States Army is the largest in the world. Mm. But, but that is according to that book, how, how I created it. I'm not a historian, so I don't know, but a very inter interesting reading. Mm. Yeah. Very interesting. So mm. it, it changes a lot of, of uh, the historical point of view because I think uh, most historians brought up thinking United States get involved because of uh, the arg argument between isolationists and the globalists. But in fact, they were more driven by their um, economic ambitions of a group of, of men. Mm -hmm. They are thinking, well, if America remain within North and South America, the, the econ economy will not sustain. That means they don't make sufficient money. They need more money. And in order to make more money, they need influences in the world, have strong influence in the rest of the world. And therefore they need an army in order to 
uh, convince their citizens to support such a large army. They need a higher org organization. And that's how United Nations is born. According to, to that book, I don't know how accurate that is. But again, that, that go back to all these um, human being able to organize ourselves through abstract thinking. What was the name of the book again? The name of the book, let me just put up. Uh, it's called um, Tomorrow, Kama, The World. And then the subtitle is The Birth of U.S. Global Supremacy. Thank you. Yeah, this, the author is Stephen uh, W-E-R-T-H-E-I-M. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, the book is not too long. Let me just pull out. Let's see how. Uh, it's only 273 pages, including everything. Oh, yeah. So it's a small book. But because I'm reading the e-copy, so uh, electronic copy, so I don't know what what it looks like in the in the. I can share the screen with you for is is um is cover. Let me just share the screen. Share screen. This one. Oh. Okay. Ah, God. Um. So this is the screen. And uh, I show you the 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 uh, content. Mm. Thanks. So what what I was talking about is in uh, in chapter four. They call it instrumental internationalism using uh, United States, a uh, United Nations as an instrument. Quite an interesting book. When is, I think it's not too old. Yeah, copyright to 2020. So. Okay, not share. Okay, any other questions? No. No. Okay, so if you want to join me at China today, we we can see see other again. So otherwise we will finish this one here. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Okay. No, Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.